You're listening to a podcast of Alan Gregg in Conversation, airing Fridays at 10 p.m. on TVO. You're one of Canada's preeminent religious scholars and spent virtually entire adult life analyzing, teaching, writing about the biblical scriptures. How in the world did you ever come to doubt the existence of the historical Jesus of Nazareth? Well, it, it's, there's no simple answer to that. It took, it took a little time. Uh, it became increasingly obvious to me over the last seven or eight years that the Jesus Seminar, which has been devoting 25 years to uh, a study of what are the authentic words of Jesus, what are the authentic actions of Jesus, were paring it down to smaller and smaller uh, amounts to the point where about 18%, I think, of what he said they thought might be authentic and about 17% of what he is said to have done might be authentic. And um, in the course of watching that process and realize that Jesus was slipping away on them and knowing myself from my own scholarship that there was nothing coming out of the first century at all in the way of hard evidence for his existence. We had the Gospels, uh, whose dating is not quite as precise as people would lead us to believe, mm -hmm. and only really come together fully about 150 uh, common era. Not, uh, but, but their origins, the tradition uh, is believed to have come out of the first century. But apart from Josephus, a, Jew, a Jewish historian, who has two interpolations, which are later Christian forgeries, mentioning Jesus Christ, we have nothing from the first century. This is why there was such a big foo about finding the supposed ossuary of James, the brother of the That we Lord. had at the Royal Ontario Museum. Well, we had at the Royal Ontario and all the scholars happened to be meeting here. Everybody was beside themselves because here for the first time in this little box that held bones, they thought they had something from the first century that was outside of but that uh, went up in, in, in sheer smoke and flames once uh, they actually got down to, to looking at it. They realized it was a forgery. So, so I realized there was very little. What I, I'm interested in evidence. If it's going to be history, let's have evidence. The funny thing was, Alan, the farther the church got away from the supposed time of Jesus' life, the more sure it became of what went, ha what, what went on. The closer it got to that supposed time, the more vague it became. That's the very reverse of what happens with any truly historical person. Well, I want to get into evidence, but, but yeah. first you called your book The Pagan Christ. Yeah. What, what do you mean by that? Well, it, it, this is partially to still continue the answer to the, your original question. I, at this point, about three years ago, was sent by a chap whom I didn't know, but who was a United Church clergyman, some material. He said, I think you should look at this material. And when I started to read it, I realized I was looking at a payload of, 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 of a fact, of evidence that I'd never seen in my life before. And as I examined this, at first I thought it can't be, and as I went on, I realized cumulatively it was. And it was proof that prior to the third or fourth centuries, Christianity had been very different from the way it was after Constantine, the Council of Nicaea, and the fourth century, that a big change had taken place. And in the course of that change, a story which had once been a universal pagan myth belonged to the Greeks, before them to the Sumerians, and particularly to the Egyptians, that that myth had been clad in Jewish form and made into a history, into a literal story. And that's what struck me. When I, when I saw that that had happened, and the way in which they were prepared to kill to burn books, to destroy the evidence of it having happened, that I realized something untoward was really at work here. Well, let, let's give our viewers some sense of, of right. the similarities, because yeah. you, you go through this evidence and you say, well, here's the New Testament. I mean, that virtually everything that Jesus was reported to have done yeah. in the Gospels, from the Sermon on the Mount to, uh, be, to, to crucifixion, yes. was told in ancient Egyptian religious uh, writing. Give yes. us some examples there the, of, of, the, of the same kind of stories that were being told four or five centuries earlier. Oh, more than that, even thousands of years earlier. Yeah, this was my astonishment. When I read for the first time, Alan, a story that had always, be, I used to be a professor of New Testament, a story that had always been problematic for me, the raising of Lazarus, mm -hmm. which is in the fourth gospel, and it's the most dramatic miracle that Jesus is supposed to have have carried out, I raised a man from the dead who had been dead four days. He was really dead. 
When I came across that story, in all its full details, in an Egyptian dress, in an Egyptian setting, right down to the two, to Martha and Mary, and to the coming forth out of the tomb, in every detail, in 1700, before the Common Era, 17 centuries earlier, I realized I was onto something. Those same scholars, Spong, yeah. and, uh, are not unaware no. of the work of... Uh, uh, well, Kuhn. yes. And, 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 and they, their analysis was, well, these stories, these myths yeah. of, uh, uh, that were found in, in Egyptian uh, yeah. religion and, and in Greco-Roman yeah. uh, religion simply foreshadowed yeah. the existence and the coming of, uh, of Jesus. This is what they say, and I was force-fed that all through seminary, and as seven years as a professor of New Testament, I force-fed it to my students, and it was hokum, and it was, it was wrong. It's not just foreshadowing. When you get down to, to, uh, to 180 exact parallels found between Horus and Jesus, 180 exact parallels, where he's saying, I am the bread of life. This is Horus. Or what the evangelicals keep throwing at me. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. So how are you going to get around that one, brother? And I say, well, have a look at this 2,000 years earlier. I am the way, the truth, and the life being said. I mean, it is so precise and so, and so exact. I, I, I can't, I can't I, you know, it blows you away. Now, you maintain that this connection yeah. between Egyptian mythology and the Christian Gospels, this connection, yeah. was deliberately destroyed through a series of kind of forgery and corruption on the part of the early Christian church. During the late second, third, and fourth centuries, the church embarked, especially empowered once 325 had happened and, and Constantine had got the agreement among the bishops and, and the, the Christian church was in, in full motion as the official uh, body uh, religion for the, for the emperor, empire. A deliberate campaign was initiated to wipe out all evidence of the connection with the pagan roots of Christianity. Why would the Christian church do that? They did it for this reason, because the pagans were mocking them and saying, you have taken our stories, our virgin births, our crucifixions, our, our everything, and you have just literalized it for the common masses and made it a simple story. And, and I mean, it's ridiculous. And so the early church fought it. They tried two tacks. They, first of all, they said, well, if there are similarities, the devil must have, by pre-plagiarism, have planted them there ahead of time. That was not very convincing. These were bright, bright people, these philosophers. When that didn't work, they started to wipe them out. They got serious. They closed the philosophical schools. They closed the school of Plato at Athens that had been, been going for four or five centuries at that at point. They burned pagan libraries. They burned. The library at Alexandria, which has just recently been reopened after all these many, many centuries, containing up to 750,000 priceless books to destroy any evidence. In fact, any picture we have of paganism comes through Christian eyes, and so naturally they get a bad press that they were the losers in, in the battle. And so you have to ask yourself, what's going on here when you have to destroy your enemy, you have to anathematize him, you have to burn his or her books, and you have to actually put a person like Hypatia, who was a lecturer at that library in Alexandria, put her to death in a horrible, horrible fashion. Now, much of the conclusions that you reach are based on uh, the likes of, of Kuhn and Massey, I mean, scholars whose work predated modern uh, scholarship. And today you <clears throat> have hundreds of... Uh, of people, including the Society of uh, Biblical Literature, yeah. who, are, who are analyzing, asking these kind of questions. But they still believe that there was a sage walking this earth 2,000 years ago who in all likelihood <clears throat> was Christ. What yeah. makes you believe that you could be so right and they so wrong? Well, because of the profundity of the scholarship of Massey and Kuhn and the people behind them, Massey spent his whole life in the British Museum with the Egyptian material. He mastered the hieroglyphics, as very few people have done. A. B. Kuhn was a brilliant, brilliant mind. I, I've studied theology at Oxford. I've studied it around other places. I belong to the Society for Biblical Literature. I'm not, I'm not unaware of what they think. Uh, and they, I just have nowhere else met 
the kind of logical, hard evidence and insight. Have any of the literalists suggested or you ever considered that perhaps God chose his son to come to earth in two different points in time, or at least two different points of time in the form of Horus and Jesus? Alan, it would be wonderful if it was only two. The, one of the books I ref reference in, 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 the, in, in The Pagan Christ is that there were 16, at least 16 crucified saviors in antiquity. In the, in the, in the various different mythologies, that this is a recurring yes. theme of There were 50. At crucifixion least. and resur resurrection. No, no, but 16 crucifixions, about 50 sun gods of various kinds all the way through the alphabet, who lived in varying degrees exactly the same kind of life with the virgin birth and with the followers and so on. Something's going on here that's very deep and archetypal in, 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 coming out of the human unconscious. Well, I, I was going to ask you that then. Yes. If, if the Jesus story yeah. is but an archetypal myth, Yes. that it repeats itself throughout centuries, millennium, yes. across civilizations. Yes. What, what does that mean? See, I object to the word but. It, 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 I wouldn't say it's but a myth. It really is a myth. And a myth is the way the ancients told the truth. They didn't believe that history was that important because history depends on are you telling the history or am I telling the history? Who's the observer here? And by what criteria are we deciding well, this merits inclusion in the history, and that merits uh, exclusion in the history. They said myth is, Joseph Campbell said, what never was. It was fictional, but always is, because what it's carrying is eternal. The history is, is ephemeral. Nobody knows what happened to JFK in Dallas that day, in spite of all the cameras and the, and the conspiracy theories and so on, but it's part of history. But in the myth, it never changes. And so in all these various forms, something very deep that is true. It's not but a myth. It is a myth. And a myth carries for the ancient sages the kernel of the truth that we really are spirit and matter. We are a, a, a twofold creature. And that's why the cross is so... That we are hardwired with this archetype? Yes. The, 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 the cross is the most primitive image practically that there is. It antedates Christianity by thousands and thousands of years in almost every aboriginal culture. And it stands for, the vertical stands for the, 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 the act of the spirit entering reality or life, and the horizontal is matter. And spirit and matter intersect, intersect and they intersect particularly in the human heart. That, that's, we are spirit and matter. And we're our struggles, uh, Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, for example, that's the ongoing struggle that each one of us has in, in our daily life. When he said to one of the, or, well, to the crowd, take up your cross and follow me, he wasn't talking about that thing that Mel Gibson had in that obscenity of a movie, uh, carrying it up the hill. He was saying, take the cross of incarnation, the fact that you are a spirit involved with matter, and struggle with that and accept it, and work that out. The basic datum of all religion belongs to the one myth that, that you can find pieces of in every part of the world is incarnation. That is to say that in some form or other, the human being has a spark, a, 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 an image, a, a flame. Uh, it's expressed in different religions in so many different ways of the divine. That is the golden fleece, that's the, 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 the golden bough, that's the holy grail, not some feminine principle or the bones of Mary Magdalene. The holy grail is the reality of the Christ, as Christians would call it, within. I, I found in these men things making sense that I didn't find anywhere else. And, and you know, this, what, where have we got with this, gotten with this search for the historical Jesus? You have a brilliant man like Dominic, John Dominic Crossan, for whom I have uh, nothing but the utmost respect, or John Spong. Uh, what are they offering to the masses after they have deconstructed and stripped and got right down to the very bare shaving of what they call the historical Jesus? They have an itinerant cynic philosopher who is a kind of a social reformer who preaches on the corners of the streets and eventually comes to a sticky end. Do, do you find good news in that? I don't find gospel in it. 
What, what about the Christians? You see, sometimes they wear a bracelet that says, what would Jesus do? Yes. That the notion that there is a historical Jesus, that there, Jesus was a real man, a man God, yes. that provides a living example yes. of how we should live our lives. Yeah. Is that not a worthy thing to believe in? Well, I wouldn't knock anyone who does it. I'm not trying to destroy anyone's faith who believes that. If that works for you as you watch this program, by all means, continue with it. I'm just saying that my experience has been that people say to me, I know I can never match that model. He has, to put it crudely, four aces up his sleeve. I don't have. So, so you're constantly mocked by this paragon of virtue who has it all going for him and who is external to you. And like Carl Jung said, if God is external to me, that doesn't do me an awful lot of good. If God is internal, however, within me, that is a God with whom I must reckon. Now, far from debunking or trying to ruin yeah. the foundations of yeah. Christianity, I mean, you, you maintain that, in fact, that the Christian faith can be far more rewarding and so, far more uh, fulsome and meaningful yeah. if we accept a non-historical and instead an allegorical, mythical Jesus. Explain yeah. that. Well, look, if you read the New Testament, and it's read every Sunday in church, they'll get up and they'll read a lesson, everybody will say, thus saith the Lord, or the word of the Lord, or something like that. And, and nine-tenths of the people there didn't understand a word of what was said. But had they understood what was said, it was something quite incredible. I mean, you have to leave reality outside the door. If you're going to take the literal approach and say that this reading from the gospel, walking on the water, or whatever it might be, if you're going to just accept that as literal as, as yesterday's newspaper, it's ludicrous. And the average ordinary person today knows it is. And they have, this is why I'm getting such response to the book. They're saying, for the first time, you, 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 <laughs> we don't have to leave our reason at the door. We don't have to uh, have a, you know, some kind of uh, a lobotomy um, to be a, a believer. They, literalism <laughs> it becomes ludicrous. Well, but if you, you see it symbolically, it becomes alive. Even before this book, I mean, you have, you have warned of yes. the perils of literal interpretation of, uh, of yes. the scriptures. Yet on the other side, you look now at the popularity of Mel Gibson's The Passion of Christ or yes. the Da Vinci Code, that literalism seems to be finding an audience and satisfying some need out there. Oh, sure, because uh, the, the foundations of the whole of our culture are rocking, and people, are, uh, people in the churches and other religious institutions, most of the bright ones, are just hanging on by their fingernails. And the majority have walked, and they're outside. So uh, uh, there's, a, there's an enormous spiritual crisis right now. Instead of a literalist interpretation of the Gospels, you advocate something called cosmic Christianity. What is that? It's a spiritual take on the gospel, and it leads to a cosmic. A cosmic spirituality is one which embraces the whole of the earth and of the sky and of the heavenly bodies and, 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 and the environment and one another. It's, it's a spirituality that gets us beyond the labeling of each other and the exclusive I'm in the club and everybody else is going to hell that I get in my mail from people from time to time. You're going to hell because you don't fit our little, you don't jump through our hoops. A cosmic spirituality is one which sees the whole of the universe as part of us, that we are, we're part with it, it belongs to us. Um, the spirit that is operative in our lives is operative in, in manifesting itself in the whole of nature. I, I mean, all the seeds are there. Christianity is already, I mean, when is, it, when is this Christmas? Christmas has to happen at the solstice of the, of the sun. But you hardly ever hear a mention of the solstice around Christmas. But that's why it's anchored there. All the gods were born on December the 25th, three days after the solstice. Why is Easter always hooked in to the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox? It's an equinoctial religion. It's a solstitial religion. It belongs to the cosmos, but we narrow it down to one paragon of virtue who is outside. And we rob each other. If everything is in Jesus, all the fullness of God, then you and I have been robbed of our potential divinity. Of the notion that God is incarnate. Yes, in each Within one of us. Each of and therefore the evolutionary thrust that can come from that is missing, and that's why 2,000 years of a historical Jesus has such an abominably, dare I say it, sick record. I am committed to a cosmic Christianity, and 
what I'm delighted about is the research of this book has helped me formulate a, a, a way of getting there, a way of understanding faith that doesn't divide us from one another. What, you know, today, Hans Kung is right. You've had him on this show. Hans Kung says what to me seems self-evident. We will never have peace on this world, in this, on this earth, as long as religions cannot get along together. How can they ever get along together, Alan, if each one of them is taking a literalistic approach to his or her own scriptures so that I am the way, the truth, and the life, as Billy Graham or Franklin Graham, his son now, would say, or as the Pope would say, I have the keys to the kingdom, or as fundamentalist Muslim. Where can we ever... So we are doomed forever to this narrow, warring intolerance of each other? What happened to your faith as you continued into this research and came to believe in the pagan Christ? I, it, it, it enlarged. It, <laughs> this book, someone said to me, it, it sounds like Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. It, it, as it goes on, I, I, I think people catch my own passion and enthusiasm for what's happening to me as I develop my thought through it. To me, it's been the biggest release of my whole life. I've been studying and looking for a cosmic faith, one that transcended all our narrow bitternesses all my life, and I found it now. You've made reference throughout this, this talk that there have been many members, or, or members within the Christian faith who've attacked you, who've seen this as, as, as heresy. What impact would you like to see this book have on, on, on Christianity? I would love to see it become, uh, uh, challenge Christianity to be uh, the cosmic uh, faith that it has the potential to come. Not that everybody would become Christians, but that everybody would have this outlook that in the other person, the sacred dwells. So that I could never condemn you to hell. I could never harm you. I could never launch a preemptive war against you and your people because you are different from me in religion or color or whatever. I would like to see a more humane and compassionate and, and universal religion rather than we have the one truth and if you don't join us you're going to hell. The letters that upset me are the letters that people send me and say Mr. Harper you're going straight to hell and you're leading other people to hell. I mean what, what kind of nonsense is this and if you believe in some kind of a literal hell which they obviously do what kind of god do you really worship and doesn't that make it possible for you to bomb the hell out of somebody else if that's really what god is like and you decide that you're going to do what's right for them if your god really is that kind of god or if he's the really the kind of god who wants to flay to pieces someone who has called his son in order to satisfy some kind of weird sense of justice. Do you want to worship that kind of God? I hope that the book produces a Christianity that is compassionate and loving and caring and accepting of me, of you, and of everyone else. Tom Harper, I want to thank you very much for joining me. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you.